Good morning, class. Jesus said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. I hope you told somebody about Jesus this week. Um, and if you didn't, I'll ask you, did you try? Okay. Uh, this morning's lesson is being held from inside a truck. I had set up outside by this beautiful scenery alongside a river here in uh, Sevierville. But uh, just as I was getting comfortable with the setting and the, uh, the picture and all of that, uh, it started to rain. So I had to retreat. And so here we are. Uh, but this, uh, <clears throat> this broadcast or, or this lesson is being done on uh, Independence Day weekend. And I hope you have uh, a great uh, holiday and you remember uh, those who gave their all so that we could be free uh, as a country. And we're going to talk about freedom today uh, in the context of uh, the greatest conversation between God and man that ever took place, and or at least the greatest one that was ever recorded. <clears throat> uh, but anyway, uh, we'll be looking at John chapter 3, verses 11 through 15, and uh, we'll get to that in just a moment. But uh, I hope you're on time reading your Bible through for the year. Uh, how else are we going to know the Word if we don't read it and study it? I hope you'll do that. Uh, in our Bible reading this week, uh, we came across the answers to these trivia questions. Uh, first, Hezekiah, Hezekiah became deathly ill and was told he was going to die. He prayed, and God heard his prayer and extended his life by how many by how many years? Oh, my word. Uh, uh, yeah, it was 15 years. And then uh, another Old Testament trivia question. Josiah became king of Israel uh, as a child, actually king of Judah. And uh, uh, how old was he when he became king? He was eight years old. Then in the New Testament, we came across the answer to this question. Two important men in, <clears throat> men in the city of Jerusalem were involved in the burial of Jesus. Who were they? Well, yeah, you know them as Nicodemus and um, uh, Joseph of Arimathea. Sorry, I had a brain cloud there for a moment. Okay, um, Jesus told us one of the last things he he said before he left to go uh, to heaven in the ascension was to go and make disciples. Go and make disciples. So uh, how do we do that? How do you make a disciple? Well, you take someone under your wing and you spend time with them week after week after week, year, month after month, year after year. Uh, so my question is, who are you discipling? And if you don't know how to get uh, uh, moving in that direction, let me recommend uh, Celebrate Recovery. It is a discipleship model uh, for small groups and one-on-one. -on -one, and it is the biblical model of discipleship where we spend time uh, with a small group. We spend time with one-on-one. Uh, -on -one, uh, and uh, we'll begin our training on Monday night of uh, the 11th of July. So if you want to be a part of that, come on out to the church uh, Monday night, July the 11th, and we'll uh, introduce you to that uh, process. Now, uh, to our text, we're going to read uh, John chapter 3, verses 11 through 15 today. Um Jesus speaking here, truly I tell you, we speak what we know and we testify to what we have seen, but you do not accept our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you don't believe, how will you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one 
who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God loved the world in this way. He gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Golly, I couldn't quit. I had to read that 16th verse. Uh, uh, but anyway, we're going to deal with the first uh, uh, few uh, verses that I read, 11 through 14. And then next week, uh, as we begin our new Sunday school class for the 20s and 30-somethings uh, and 40s uh, uh, at Eastwood Baptist Church, I hope you'll come if you're in the area. Uh, and if you're not, pray for us. We're starting a Sunday school class from scratch, and uh, that's uh, always a bit of a labor. Uh, but uh, we're looking forward to it. So let's let's begin uh, 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 with what Jesus said there in verse 11. Uh, Truly, I tell you, we speak what we know and we testify what we have seen, but you do not accept our testimony. So here is uh, uh, Nicodemus who came to Jesus by night and uh, uh, Warren Wiersbe said, and he's still in the dark. Uh, at this point, he is. He's still in the dark because he doesn't get it. Uh, he is, uh, according to the law, blameless um, and uh, has kept the law, is keeping the law, and is uh, uh, doing probably as well as any human could do at keeping the law, but um, still, he's not in the kingdom, and he knows it. Um, we, you remember last week, we talked about that part of the conversation where uh, Nicodemus comes to Jesus, and he begins with the, this cover story uh, that we know that you're a man sent from God because nobody could do what you do except God be with him. And he didn't realize that he was talking to God in those moments. He didn't get it. Uh, and Jesus replied to what was going on in his mind and his heart. And apparently he was concerned about his relationship with God and he had no satisfaction that he was in the kingdom. And uh, it's very likely that's what drove him to seek Jesus. So Jesus, knowing all of that about him and knowing what was troubling his heart, said that um, uh, no man can even see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. You can't even see the kingdom, Nicodemus. Uh, and then he goes on a little later and says you can't enter the kingdom of God unless you're born again. So... Nicodemus brings his need, and Jesus knows his need, even though Nicodemus has not uh, expressed it. <clears throat> and Jesus knows the condition of his heart, that he is not a believer, that he is apparently seeking. Um, and Jesus honors that with uh, a conversation about uh, being born again and about coming into the kingdom, seeing the kingdom, entering the kingdom. And uh, uh, by the way, if you're watching this morning or even later, if you would leave uh, a message and say hello or you're watching uh, or when you get to a point of something or you hear something you like, say amen or you agree or whatever, uh, I appreciate that. It, it encourages me a lot. Thank you so much. Um, so Nicodemus uh, is is comes to Jesus by night and he's still in the dark. He is a non-believer. He's a good man at the top of his craft, at the top of the religious pecking order, and yet he is without any uh, uh, satisfaction that he's in the kingdom because he's not in the kingdom. And Jesus addresses that with him. And in uh, verse 10, as, you, as we wrap up last week's lesson, are you a teacher? And in, in some 
uh, 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 versions, it says, are you the teacher of Israel and don't know these things? Uh, truly, Jesus goes on to say, I tell you, we speak what we know. How does Jesus know about the kingdom of God? How does Jesus know about how to get into the kingdom, how to see the kingdom, how to enter the kingdom? How does he know that? Well, because before there was a creation, before there ever was the first man, uh, uh, Jesus in the mind of the Father died on the cross to provide a way of salvation, the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. So here Jesus in probably the most important conversation about salvation that's ever been recorded uh, here we have the high and holy uh, uh, moment where Jesus is the evangelist and Nicodemus is the one in need of evangelism, in need of salvation. And we hear exactly what the terms of salvation are. And Nicodemus has spent his life uh, working to do the right things to gain entrance into the kingdom. Uh, under the law, uh, and and focused on do this, do that, don't do this, don't do that, and that has been his uh, focus, and and he's apparently done a good job of it because he has risen to the pinnacle of that religion at the time, and Jesus says it's not about doing Nicodemus, it's not. It's, let me give you an illustration, he says, uh, just as a person is born uh, in the flesh, you uh, being born had nothing to do, uh, you had no control over that process, no, no, no control over that process. And uh, it was in, in spiritual birth, it's God that does everything. It's not in the doing. It's not in keeping the law. It's not in doing good works. It's not in giving to the poor. It's not rescuing uh, uh, animals. It's, it's not in saving the whales. It is not in doing. And that's what he's telling Nicodemus. Now, there, that's the negative. We're going to look at the positive in just a few moments. But he says, uh, I'm telling you, Nicodemus, what we know, what we know. And uh, we're going to testify to what we have seen. So Nicodemus, please pay attention. Uh, we speak what we know and we testify what we've seen because Jesus was in, uh, uh, was in the beginning with the Father and nothing was created except he created it and he sustains it with his own word. Uh, so he says, we know, and we testify to what we've seen, but here is the damning statement, the judgmental statement from Jesus himself, and he says, but you don't believe it. I'm telling you the truth from that was the truth from the beginning and the truth that is explained throughout all of the Old Testament scriptures that you know by heart. Uh, the New Covenant uh, uh, a language that's used there in the Old Testament around the Lamb, the blood, the Passover, uh, uh, the washing with water, the, the cleansing and the forgiveness that's there. And you don't believe me. And you don't believe my testimony. <clears throat> you don't believe my authority. Uh, Nicodemus was not ready to give up his pride in his position and in his authority. Uh, it is, uh, 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 legend tells us that uh, Nicodemus was one of the three richest men in Jerusalem. And through that, he was one of the most influential people in the city of Jerusalem at the time. And this is the man that comes to Jesus because he's driven to Jesus because the need of his own heart. 
And Jesus is telling him it's not in keeping the law. He says, Here's, here is a hint, Nicodemus. You don't believe. Five times between now and the 18th verse, you'll see uh, uh, Jesus talk about believing. Now, last week we spent time talking about it's not what you do. It's not what you do. It's not uh, doing this and doing that or don't do this and don't do that that gets you into heaven. So that was the negative. Now we talk about the, we're going to talk about the positive. Uh, Jesus says, you don't believe, Nicodemus, and that's the thing. That's the thing that is the key to connection with God and uh, eternal life. So it is about believing. Excuse me, I've got a mosquito here. I got a dispatch. Okay. Um, it's about believing. Um, you don't accept our testimony. You don't believe what I'm t what I'm telling you. Golly, if Nicodemus had realized he was talking to the God of the universe, would he have believed in those moments? But there's evidence that he didn't believe yet. Uh, and then we see him making progress as he stands up for Jesus. We don't know that he believed at that point uh, a little later. But then at the end, and I used it in my trivia question this morning, in the end, he made a public declaration of his uh, 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 relationship to Jesus when he and Joseph of Arimathea came and claimed the body of Jesus and took it for burial. But Jesus begins to tell him, uh, golly, but you don't accept my testimony or our testimony. If I had told you about earthly things and you don't believe, how will you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? How can I discuss with you uh, the things uh, that uh, pertain to eternity and godliness and, and a relationship with the heavenly Father? How can I talk to you about those things when you don't even understand how a natural birth is related to uh, coming into the kingdom, that it's not by my, not by power that we're born into the kingdom. It's a work of God. It's not by what you do. It's by what God does. So then he comes to believing. So he's saying that here is your part. Being born into the kingdom is God's part. That is the work of God. You don't contribute to it. You don't control it. God does it all. But your part, your part is to believe. Uh, and if I've told you earthly things and you don't believe, how will you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. So he's He's uh, making a declaration about heavenly things to him, and uh, uh, Nicodemus is 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 hearing the best presentation of the gospel message that has ever been given. No preacher has ever been as eloquent and as convincing and as clear and concise as Jesus was in this moment in telling Nicodemus. Uh, reading the heart of Nicodemus, reading the thoughts of Nicodemus, and uh, and with that, then delivering the message that was in tune with the heart of Nicodemus. So, verse fourteen, uh, we're gonna we're gonna begin the wind down here with verse fourteen, um, and 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 fifteen. And so let's read that. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the man, uh, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in Him may have eternal life. For God loved the world in this way. Uh, that I'm sorry. For uh, so that 
everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. So last week it was, you can't do anything to gain uh, a relationship with God. You can't be good enough. You can't do enough good. And now he's saying that's God's part to bring you into the kingdom. It's your part to believe that he can and that he will. So, uh, he uses this imagery from Numbers chapter 21. And in Numbers chapter 21, the children of Israel were, uh, 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 they had just handed a defeat to one of their enemies, a Canaanite king, uh, by the, uh, uh, the king of Arad. And now they set out uh, uh, on the way of the Red Sea to bypass the land of Edom. But the people became impatient in the journey, and they spoke against God and Moses. So God sent snakes among them, uh, vipers, poisonous snakes. Um, and, and the people were uh, bitten, and the poison killed a bunch of them. And so in repentance, they came to Moses and said, Oh, we have sinned. And uh, inter they ask, intercede with the Lord so that he'll take the snakes away from us. Now here is, it, it, I wish we could drill down here and talk about this, this uh, request. Uh, they were instructing God on how to deal with their problem, uh, which is uh, typically a mistake. Uh, they wanted the snakes to be removed. Well, God didn't do that. Um uh, Moses intercede for the people, and God told Moses, make a brass snake and put it on a pole and, and stick it up in the sky, uh, lift it up where it can be seen, and whenever someone is bitten, he looked at the bronze snake and he recovered. God did not take the snakes out of the country. He provided a remedy for the poison. Ooh, isn't that exciting? Think about today. Uh, we would pray that God would remove the wicked from out of the country, uh, that the uh, all pornography would be removed, all alcohol would be removed, all uh, poisonous drugs would be removed, and uh, so that addiction wouldn't be so prevalent. But God doesn't do that. God has a solution for the poison that infects us. Uh, he's not removing the snakes. Hmm. Oh, think of that. He's not removing the snakes, but he's providing a solution for the poison. And there's poison all around us. Uh, and some, uh, uh, at times, there's poison in us. But God has uh, provided a provision for the poison. Uh, so Jesus is saying to Nicodemus, uh, and he's telling him a story that he knows inside and out, frontwards and backwards, uh, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness. He's harking back to that Numbers 21 uh, uh, picture of the solution for the poison that was killing the people. And today, oh my there is poison killing the people today. Uh, there, there, there's uh, uh, the poison of drugs. There's the poison of pride. There's the poison of uh, uh, there's the poison of of uh, uh, all kinds of addictions and compulsive behaviors. Oh, can't we? Can't we see that? Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness. By the way, when he lifted up the snake in the wilderness, the people didn't form a committee on how to deal, uh, uh, to hire somebody to remove the snakes. Um, uh, and, and they didn't, uh, uh, try to figure out how to come up with a self-help solution for removing snakes. They didn't, uh, uh, the solution was not uh, in killing the snakes, in making medicine, pretending that they weren't there, uh, passing anti-snake laws, or climbing 
the pole where the serpent was? The answer to the snake problem and the poison problem was looking by faith at the uplifted serpent. Now, why is the uplifted serpent a symbol of Jesus on the cross? Um, and Jesus tells us that it is. So, uh, verse 15, so that everyone, um, uh, I'm sorry, verse 14, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. The lifted up has two uh, meanings. It means to be lifted up on the cross or to be elevated in worship. Both of them are appropriate at this uh, at, at this moment. So, uh, just as Jesus, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. Uh, Jesus became a snake. Jesus became that poison uh, for us. He became sin for us. And so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. Nicodemus, your pride is standing in the way of you coming to know Jesus. Nicodemus, come and believe. The Son of Man's going to be lifted up. And Jesus here, for the first time, describes how he's going to die. He knows. By the way, it's been planned from before the foundation of the earth. It's not a surprise to Jesus that he's going to the cross. As a matter of fact, that's the purpose that he came. So Jesus is telling Nicodemus that he's going to be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. By the way, that is the work of the Holy Spirit is to lift up Jesus. Oh, that he is uh, always concerned in lifting up Jesus. And now you can look to Jesus and be saved. I want to uh, tell you a story. Uh, it really happened. Uh, on January the 6th, 1850, a snowstorm almost crippled the sitter of Colchester, England, and a teenage boy was unable to get to the church he usually attended. So he made his way to a nearby primitive Methodist chapel where an ill-prepared layman was substituting because the preacher didn't show up. His text was Isaiah 45:22. Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. Uh, for many months, this young teenager had been miserable and under deep conviction. But though he had been reared in church, both his father and his grandfather were preachers. He had no assurance of his salvation. The unprepared substitute layman didn't have much to say, so he kept repeating the text. A man need not go to college uh, to learn how to look, he shouted. Anyone can look. Even a child can look. About that time, he saw the visitor sitting over to one side, and he pointed at him and said, Young man, you look very miserable. Young man. Look to Jesus. The young man did look to Jesus by faith. And that's how the great preacher, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, was converted. Look to Jesus. If there is anything that uh, uh, I could say that would help today, it is look to Jesus. He has been lifted up. He said, if I be lifted up, or so the Son of Man must be lifted up, and he was on the cross, so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. You can't do enough to be saved. You can't do enough to be right. But you can believe. That's all it takes. And I want to uh, uh, encourage you. Believe in Jesus today. He's been lifted up, and he said, 
that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. So look to Jesus today. Look at him. Believe in him. Now let's pray. Father, thank you for this time. And I pray that you would speak to hearts with this message as you have down through the centuries to encourage people to get past their pride, to get past, past their attempts to do something to be saved. And instead, to simply look at Jesus and believe. And we ask it in your name. Amen.